uh, this you know state of the art technology could be replaced much more easily and and uh, efficiently and probably more accurately with the smartphone in your pocket today. Um, so these were great jobs. I saw a lot of wonderful places. I worked with great people. I saw a lot of cool critters, and also. Uh, somewhat disturbingly, but also fascinatingly, I got very close to some of the quite vehement and and sometimes even violent politics surrounding endangered species in the rural West. And, and those politics continue um, within and outside the West today, of course. Uh, and what struck me about those was not only how passionate those disagreements were, but how fundamental the questions were that were being asked. I mean, people were not... <laughs> standing around in town halls and coffee shops discussing whether, you know, which ORV trail should be closed because of a certain species or which housing development might, should be curtailed for the welfare of the species. They were saying, why is this species important? Why is it our responsibility to protect it? Why this species and not another one? Why us and not them? And, uh, as someone interested in conservation, I had this vague sense that that smart people of the past had, had considered these questions and come up with some provisional answers. But I think like most conservationists now and then, I didn't have a strong sense of conservation as a movement, um, by which I mean a, a, a movement of people over generations that had proposed ideas, built on other people's ideas, um, collaborated, disagreed, and, and made progress over time. So I came away with, from those uh, couple years worth of seasonal jobs with um, Yes, here we go. With uh, lots of questions and <laughs> a lot of uh, unfinished intellectual business, so to speak. And what I did in the next 20 years or so was become a journalist and I continue to, I wrote about conservation and reported on conservation. I continue to have a very similar experience where the conversations I was hearing were, you know, often engaged in with good faith on all sides, but they tended to go in circles. They were really, the conversations over individual species and individual places were, were really uh, conducted without a lot of ecological context, without a lot of historical context. And as I learned a little bit more about the history of the conservation movement, I started to think, well, maybe it would be helpful in a small way to try to tell the history of the essentials of the history of conservation in a way that would be accessible to people, to professional conservationists, as well as people who were just interested or affected by conservation in some way. And uh, as, I, as far as I know, nothing quite like this had been done. You, you tend to find a summary of Concert, the main points of the conservation movement in a lot of textbooks about conservation biology. And there are certainly many, many biographies written about prominent conservationists, but uh, there wasn't really an accessible synthesis out there. Um, and as soon as I started to try and do that, I realized why there wasn't such a thing. It was very difficult to, uh, to try to boil down something as complicated and diverse as the conservation movement into a, a more or less linear narrative. But I did finally pull it out of my head, and that was that is my book, Beloved Beast, that was published earlier this year. So my more immediate motivation for writing this book was a real frustration with the way stories about conservation get told by journalists like me, and, and even by most conservation groups. Uh, the stories that conservation groups tell their supporters tend to look very much like this. Uh, and that this is a collection of headlines from a recent week in the news. Um, most of them are, are about large charismatic animals, uh, single species that are on the proverbial brink of extinction. They are about to blink out. And I should say every extinction is important. Every extinction is a tragedy. They are irreversible. And they need to be, these stories need to be told. But if this is the only narrative or one of the very few narratives we're telling about conservation, first of all, I think it's a bit counterproductive because it's so depressing by the time a species gets to this point um, in its decline, it's very difficult for ordinary citizens to do anything to help it. You know, it's really dependent on extremely high tech labor intensive measures like captive breeding and reintroduction to save it from extinction. And 
And it also, these stories, if, when they become the dominant narrative, I think obscure what conservation, what conservationists have learned that conservation is really about, and that it's about a lot more than just, just quote unquote, preventing extinction. Of course, preventing extinction is important. That's the building block of conservation. But it's not about, you know, saving two members of each species um, and just keeping them on the planet. It's really, ideally, our goal, goal of conservation is to protect relationships, ecological relationships, cultural relationships among species, between species and their habitats, and between humans and other species. And I think this is what the conservation movement has learned over the several generations that it's been in existence. So I wanted to get this across, and, and this is the way I set up the book was to, um, and my daughter thinks that this, <laughs> my daughter thinks this slide looks like a Zoom call of every everyone who was in my book, which made me think that uh, that would be delightful were it possible. It'd be so interesting to hear these people talk to each other. Um, so I chose uh, people who, to my mind, represented Turn, important turning points had brought about turning points in the conservation movement. They had proposed new ideas. They had had notable successes. Um, none of these people is perfect, as I'll talk about. Some of them had quite glaring uh, blind spots, but each of them advanced conservation, advanced the project of conservation in some way. And I, I should just make a note here that when I speak of the, the modern conservation movement, I'm differentiating it from the kind of conservation that at the beginning of human history, the animals in their backyard, controlling, say, their own hunting of animals in their backyard for practical or spiritual reasons. Um, the modern conservation movement started in the late 1800s, and it was distinctive because it was a, a concerted effort to protect species that its supporters may or may not ever encounter in their daily lives. So it was protecting not only species that were close by, but species that were far away and whose fates might be affected by, um, by the people who cared about them and, and just on the planet. So as much as I uh, complain about extinction being one of the only news hooks for conservation, it was a powerful motivator in starting the uh, the modern conservation movement in the late 1800s. And, and I'm always struck when I when I look at the sweep of human history, I'm always struck by the fact that this idea that we can cause species extinctions is a relatively new idea. I think all of us grew up with the idea of, if you went through a dinosaur phase, you were very familiar with the idea of extinction from an early age. It's, it's a familiar, if tragic, concept. But for a long time, people thought that species were creations of God. They never changed regardless of what humans might do to them or not do to them. Uh, then people realized, oh, okay, species have gone extinct. This was at the close of the 1700s. People acknowledged, okay, species have gone extinct because we found these bones that, that you know, belong to species we've never encountered. However, uh, humans don't have the power to drive species extinct. And then slowly over the course of the 1800s, people in North America and Europe came to grips with the fact that their actions had uh, created demand for products that had had encouraged uh, explorers and uh, and colonists to travel all over the world. And in many cases, especially when they turned up on isolated islands, they brought with them small predators, rats, and cats that that the species who were living on these islands had no idea how to deal with and were quickly driven extinct. Um, and one of those, of course, was the dodo. Um, and it wasn't, the dodo likely went extinct in the 1600s, but it really wasn't until the 1800s when people were grappling with this idea of human caused extinctions that, that they looked back in history and said, oh, the dodo is a species that our ancestors were familiar with, that they wrote about, and we have bones of the dodo, but it no longer exists. And we know that it was our fault. Uh, we know that our actions and the creatures we brought along with us drove the dodo um, to extinction and we'll never we'll never have it back. And and people were were this was a quite um, striking idea to people and quite disturbing, um, but also 
kind of exciting and inspiring. Wow. Um, again, this is happening at the same time that Darwin had proposed his theory of evolution. So people were realizing, OK, we're in some ways not as powerful as we were once told. You know, we, we're not we're not, you know, special creations of God. According to evolution, we, we are much closer to other animals than than we have believed in the past. But we are more powerful than we have believed in the past because we have this disturbing ability to drive a species extinct. So, so the idea of extinction started popping up in popular culture, um, probably most notably in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, where Lewis Carroll made his alter ego a, a dodo. And, um, and his Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is probably the main reason why we have um, the dodo remains our symbol of extinction today. So people were still um, wrestling with this idea of, of um, extinction in the late 1800s, and they still hadn't quite come around to the idea that, that uh, very large, physically large, extremely abundant species could go extinct due to human activities. And, and the, the example that really brought that home to many people in North America was, of course, the American bison, which was nearly driven extinct over the course of the 1800s because of commercial hunters and demand for buffalo robes in both North America and Europe. And when people finally accepted that this was happening, uh, there, many of them went into another form of denial. They, they, they said, well, that's very sad. You know, this is a majestic animal, but Perhaps this is the price of progress, the price of national progress. And it took a few people, among them uh, William Temple Hornaday, who's this fellow in the middle with the, the stick and the, the black hat, um, to say, no, this is, this is not just sad, this is a moral outrage, and it's possible for us to prevent it. You know, let's not just sit back and let it, let's try to stop it. And William Temple Hornaday was a very complicated man. He did many things that we would consider reprehensible today. And, and uh, he did many things that may or may not have been that useful to the bison. But one thing that he did that we know was helpful is he raised a small herd of bison in the Bronx on, on what is now the grounds of what is now the Bronx Zoo. And these bison did quite well and they were healthy enough for him to put on a train and send to Oklahoma in 1907 where they, they did even better. And um, they were the seed of, of a herd that still exists today. And they, had, they then became the herd, the seed of several herds that were moved to other parts, other pieces of public land throughout the plains. So at this time, there were a few bison that were surviving on, public, on, on private ranches, but really Hornaday, not single-handedly, but he had a, a central role in ensuring that we started the century with relatively healthy numbers of bison on public lands in the Indies. And now Hornaday's motivations for protecting the bison were a bit complicated. Uh, like his friend Theodore Roosevelt, the, the future president, he believed that hunting bison and hunting other large animals of the plains was, was a, a properly masculine activity and that the bison should be protected in order to protect white elite masculinity, which was believed to be, which was thought to be under threat at the time. The nation was industrializing. A lot of young men were going to work in, in offices. They were thought to be kind of wasting away and in need of an adventure on the plains. So their, their motivations were, they, I think many of them genuinely admired the bison, they admired its beauty and its power, but they, their motivations for, for protecting it from extinction were mostly um, for the benefit of humans or for their, their own benefit. They, they also love to hunt themselves. And um, Hornaday in particular, and, and many of his colleagues, but Hornaday notably, was, was almost willfully ignorant about the people who really were most directly hurt by the decline of the bison, and that is, of course, the Native American and First Nations of the Native American tribes and First Nations of the North American Plains, who, as the bison declined, really lost their, their central source of, of food and cultural strength and shelter. And he, despite a lot of contemporary evidence to the contrary, he uh, insisted that Native Americans were, in fact, primarily responsible for the bison slaughter when, when it was clearly established that uh, it was my commercial hunters who had done uh, 
most of the damage to the herds of the plains. So Hornaday's life was full of ironies, uh, but it does have, it ends with what to me is a very happy irony, which was, is that in the decades after Hornaday's death, a new coalition of conservationists has built upon his work. So Hornaday basically treated the bison like cows. He, ecology was a very young science at the time. He wasn't an ecologist. His goal was just to put more bison out on the plains, which you know was an important, <laughs> that was an important goal, uh, given that the species was in such dire straits. But he didn't have a sense of how the bison, can, you know, how the bison influenced other species on the plains, how other species influenced the bison, how the prairie was an ecosystem uh, in which the bison was a keystone species. And as I said, he really didn't have a sense um, of the cultural importance of the bison. And this newer coalition of people is taking Hornaday's work and attempting to not only put more bison on the plains, but put them in more places so that they can resume more of those ecological relationships. And since this coalition is led mostly by tribes and First Nations, they are also very explicitly attempting to do a cultural restoration of bison. Many of these bison are coming back to tribal lands where bison are still very important in stories and ceremonies, but have not been seen <laughs> in the flesh for several generations. And it's quite moving to see how people react to the return of the living animal to their lands. So to me, this is one of the most exciting projects happening in conservation for those reasons, but also because they're working with species that are under extinction. They're working with species that actually is doing pretty well. We have a couple of hundred thousand bison on the plains. They're not about to go extinct. It's just that there is an opportunity to do a fuller, to push them toward what we might think of as a fuller recovery. So our friend uh, Hornaday after, had a long and eventful life, and after he did his work on the bison, he switched his attention to birds. Um, he, at the time, in the early 1900s, birds were under threat for several reasons. Um, one reason was that the people who loved them like to shoot them. <laughs> uh, natural historians didn't have access to cheap binoculars at the time, so it was standard practice for people to go into the field with a rifle and, and shoot several dozen specimens of the species they wanted to study, take them back to their home study or their, their university lab and get a closer look at them. Since natural history was very important, very popular at the time, this added up to a lot of birds. Uh, the other real uh, danger that birds were in was uh, they were in danger of becoming hats. <laughs> and you can see these crazy hats that were popular in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Like most fads, this, this fad sort of built on itself um, until people were went from wearing, you know, a couple of feathers on their hat to wearing entire birds. And there's examples of, you know, people wearing these elaborate sort of mini terraria on their heads where they have a stuffed bird and a rat and a moss and some rocks and, <laughs> and this created an enormous demand for birds um, especially neotropical birds from the southeast of so egrets and flamingos um, species with showy feathers and millions and millions of birds were killed each year to supply the plume trade and conservationists like William Hornaday reacted to this in a somewhat predictable way by blaming the consumer, um, who in this case happened to be a woman. And there were lots of cartoons like this showing a woman in fancy dress shooting a bunch of egrets. Um, you know, people were quite horrified. Once the toll on birds became clear, people were quite horrified um, by, by what was happening to birds. And, and so a lot of outrage was directed toward women. And Hornaday himself wrote this essay for the um, front page of the New York Times women's section called Woman, the Juggernaut of the Bird World. <laughs> I'm not sure if this persuaded, <laughs> if attacking his his intended readers uh, had, did much good, but, uh, but he expressed himself in quite colorful terms. Um, it took Virginia Woolf, the, the British author who was supportive of, of uh, banning the plume trade in her native Britain, to point out that the beginning of this quote goes something like, I, I spare no sympathy for the society woman who thinks that a lemon-colored egret is a 
fetching addition to her evening dress. But let's remember the birds are killed by men, starved by men, and tortured by men, not vicariously, but with their own hands. And she could have added as well that while women were primarily the primary consumers of the plume trade, the primary customers of the plume trade, they were also its primary opponents. People like Harriet Lawrence Hemingway, who was a wealthy um, Bostonian, really was um, a very savvy strategic activist and, and her work helped uh, reignite the Audubon movement, which at the time had it had existed for about a decade, but had gone dormant. And the Audubon movement led the way to the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, which was at the time there was no, there were real, there were a few hunting laws here and there, but there were really no legal protections for these gorgeous birds that we value today. So the Migratory Bird Treaty Act remains one of our most important pieces of conservation legacy, uh, conservation legis legislation, excuse me. Uh, in the US, if not the world. And soon in the years after it was passed, the five or six years after it was passed, volunteer birders went into the field and did an annual survey of bird populations of all kinds, but especially in the Southeast. And they were they witnessed, you know, once you stop shooting birds by the by the millions, the populations tend to recover and they just saw a huge recovery. A uh, very direct result of this legislation in many of these bird populations that were popular for trade. Uh, similar legislation was passed in the UK a few years later. Uh, more laws were passed over the following years in other European countries, and um, that really drove the stake into the heart of trade. So as with Hornaday, uh, the work of these early activists who passed the Migratory Bird Treaty Act was not done. Um, as this activist who, who followed them in the 1920s and 30s pointed out uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act did not protect birds of prey. It did not protect raptors who at the time were considered pests even by many conservationists. Uh, she, I love this quote of hers, this Rosalie Edge was a, was a Manhattan socialite who she, she didn't have a uh, formal education in science, but she was so sharp. She had she had gained her activist skills in the suffrage movement and she came to conservation. She just raised heck with the Audubon board and, and told you know, the, the conservation establishment as it was at the time that they really needed to step up and not just protect these species that they liked and admired because they were beautiful or fun to hunt or, um, or you know, especially vulnerable. They needed to protect every species regardless of their feelings about it because as she said, each is a link in a living chain. And, and this may not seem like a particularly startling statement. Now we hear many things like this, but at the time, I mean, people were, scientists were just beginning to talk about things like the food web. Uh, the term ecosystem had just been coined. So these ideas were relatively new, even in scientific circles. They certainly weren't um, conventional wisdom among the public. So, so she was quite ahead of her time. And one of the most important things she did was to establish a place called the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, which exists today in Pennsylvania. Uh, she, by establishing the sanctuary, she stopped a local tradition of hunters uh, climbing a, a local ridgetop and shooting hawks as they migrated overhead. This was kind of a, a local tradition slash entertainment slash practical measure because they believed, these hunters believed that uh, hawks were preying on small livestock like chickens and so forth when that was quite exaggerated. Um, and Rosalie Edge wanted to stop this prep, this practice. So she turned the ridge top into a sanctuary. And, and she also crucially instructed the, the manager of the sanctuary to start taking note of how many birds of each species passed overhead during the fall and spring migrations. And the sanctuary caretaker, Maurice Brown, duly started to do this. And uh, the sanctuary was established in 1934. He took a couple years off when he was deployed in World War II, but otherwise continued this data gathering and the record continues today. Uh, it's, it's the longest record of raptor migrations uh, in the world. There are many other raptor watch sites, but this one is the oldest and its record is the longest. And so about 10 years or so after the founding of 
Clock Mountain Sanctuary, it found a visit from Rachel Carson, who at the time was working for the Fish and Wildlife Service as a communications specialist. Uh, somewhat unhappily, she wanted to, she was really hoping to quit and, and write full time. Uh, but she was very impressed by Hawk Mountain. She never published what she wrote about it, but uh, her papers, there's some really beautiful notes on, on how striking the place is. And then about 15 years later, when she was writing her, oh, excuse me, when she was writing her famous book, Silent Spring, she wrote to Maurice Brown, the caretaker, and said, I've heard, you know, I remember hearing about this, this record of bird, of raptor migrations that you've been keeping, and, and I've heard through the grapevine that you have seen some interesting changes in the eel population, and I'm writing a book about the possible effects of pesticides on wildlife, and you tell me more about what you've seen. And, and Maurice Brown wrote back and said, of course, uh, and it is very interesting and disturbing what I've been seeing. I've been taking this record now for a couple of decades, and we always have large numbers of bald eagles, but in the past few years, the numbers of bald e the numbers of young bald eagles have really dropped off. And in fact, last year I saw no young bald eagles at all. And this was included in Silent Spring. And and Silent Spring was an argument about DDT, but it really she um, was an argument about the effects of DDT. But Rachel Carson really had to build an argument like a lawyer. There was not a conclusive scientific case of cause and effect. She really had to take a lot of observations and anecdotes that were being made in different places at different times and say, look, you know, the common thread, common possible cause in all these cases is DDT. And so I think we can say beyond a reasonable doubt that DDT is the culprit. But the pieces of evidence was very especially the uh, piece of evidence from Hawk Mountain as she acknowledged in the book. And I often think, okay, you know, it, without the activists who whose work led to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, without the work of Rosalie Edge, who helped protect raptors and establish the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary and started this record of, my, of raptor migrations, without Maurice Brown, who actually carried out these observations, um, Rachel Carson would not have had this really crucial piece of evidence um, against DDT. And as popular as her book was, and as much of a sensation as it made, it took 10 years and a lot of work by other activists, more than 10 years actually, um, to actually to ban the use of DDT after the publication of Silent Spring. So had we not had that piece of evidence from Hawk Mountain, her case might have been less persuasive and you know might still be using DDT or we might have used it for many decades longer and we would certainly be living in a very different, much quieter world today. So I want to, um, this is my, my last uh, set of connections I wanna talk about and I, I particularly want to mention Julian Huxley because he has a Houston connection. Um, Julian Huxley was a, was a British biologist, and if his name sounds familiar, but you are not familiar with Julian Huxley, maybe because you've heard of Aldous Huxley, his younger brother, who's looking kind of Eric in this picture, um, but is uh, he was a famous novelist. He was much more famous than Julian in his time and continues to be so today. He wrote the novel uh, Brave New World, which if you haven't run into, it's still worth reading today. It's a dystopian imagination of, of a possible future. And these two brothers were, were very close, carried on a lifelong correspondence, even though they often disagreed with each other. And, and they were both the grandsons of Thomas Henry Huxley, who was a famously a friend and public defender of Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was actually a very shy man. Uh, he hesitated for many years before publishing his theory of evolution. And Thomas Henry Huxley was a also a brilliant man, but kind of had the advantage of being kind of a loudmouth and, and was happy to go out in public and, and defend Darwin's honor uh, and defend the theory of evolution to, to all comers. And so for the Huxley brothers, biology ran in their blood. Um, Aldous addressed it often in his fiction and Julian followed more directly in his grandfather's footsteps and became a biologist himself. 
And the Houston connection is that when he was a, quite a young man, had just finished with his graduate degree, he became the chair, I believe he was the founding chair of the biology department at Rice. And he spent uh, several years in Texas, uh, driving his little Model A around Texas and having all kinds of American adventures as a young, as a young Brit in the States. And uh, his papers are kept at Rice or housed at Rice. And Huxley was a very complicated man, as I'll talk about in a, like any of the people I wrote about, and, and I'll talk about why in a second. But so, you know, some of his ideas have not stood up. Some of them have, have endured. He had lots of them. <laughs> and perhaps because he did have so many of them, no one has really written a definitive biography of Huxley. People have pulled out pieces of what he's done. And so I suspect, I haven't had a chance to dig into the Huxley papers myself, but I suspect uh, because he had his fingers in so many pies and because he was, because of his grandfather in part was famous from such a young age, he did a lot of thinking in public and a lot of his, so he's a, he's a uh, digits correspondent. He was a very active speaker. And I, as I said, I suspect there are a lot of gems in those archives that would be worth looking at for anyone who's in search of an interesting research project. And so um, the probably Julian Huxley's most lasting accomplishment was to found the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And uh, in fact, it, the IUCN, as it's referred to, still exists today. It has an international conference every four years, and it happens to be starting today in France. Um, and Huxley started the organization in the 1960s when he was working for the UN. And it was important because it drew together governments and nonprofit organizations into an international network dedicated to protecting species and protecting nature in general. And there, there was not, I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but there was not such an organization before that. People were certainly talking to each other, but even though species pay no attention to national borders in many cases, there was not a, an organization that transcended uh, borders and that was really dedicated to protecting species worldwide. And so the IUCN has been important because it's it has cemented relationships among conservationists and among governments in the service of conservation. But it has also served as a as a repository of data about endangered and other species worldwide, because before the IUCN was created, you know, certain people knew about certain species, but what they knew was, you know, locked away in their heads or in their offices. It was not, um, it was not pulled together in any single accessible place. And today, thanks to the IUCN, we have a thing called the Red List, which many of you have probably heard of, and that is the most um, respected source of information about species that are vulnerable uh, to extinction. Um, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scientists who contribute their work to the, to the Red List every year. So uh, Huxley was, Huxley's work on the international level was really important. Um, he, his failing, if he, if he had a failing, was that he was overly uh, trustful of centralized authority. He really he liked the idea of societies being run by scientists. He, he was not an egalitarian. He, he really had he had dreams of you know world, a world government that would that would organize everything and you know <laughs> and uh, and keep all these messy human beings in line and he, he really ignored and and he was not unusual in that in that predilection in among elite scientists of his time and among elite Europeans and North Americans of his time. Um, so his accomplishments on the international level was, were important, but they led to, uh, he, he really ignored the, the importance of more grassroots efforts. And so that lack was filled in, in part, or began to be filled in by a sociologist named Eleanor Ostrom, who came, started her work in the 1960s. So at about the time that the IUCN was getting started, and she really questioned this idea that ordinary human beings were not capable of managing their own resources, that they needed a um, that they needed some kind of state authority or outside authority to help them 
uh, from wasting their resources. They couldn't they couldn't share them in any cooperative way. And she said that doesn't seem right because I you know I I've I've seen some communities in the U.S. and elsewhere that that have seemed to have accomplished that without outside help. And and she dedicated her career to documenting these communities and. There are, of course, many places in the world where communities are, are wasting their resources, but she found examples of systems that communities have developed over time, sets of rules that have allowed societies to protect their own resources, um, use them in a sustainable way. And this was, you know, she was she was not inventing this. She was documenting things that were already happening. But she brought attention. She brought the conservation world's attention to this capability of many people on Earth, and and it has led to a resurgence in what is called community-based conservation, where people, where conservation groups are paying attention to conservation at the international level, but they're pairing it with attention to. Uh, the ability of people to conserve their local resources. And I was able to visit a community conservancy network in Namibia that's been in place for about 30 years and is now um, a now is a national network supported by the national government. Um, and I found it just as a visitor, I found it really exciting because Namibia, as in many other places, societies have been managing their local species or local resources, trees, water, and game animals uh, for many years. But those relationships were disrupted in some cases by colonialism, where people came in, um, established national parks where local people no longer had access to wildlife. And local people came to think of wildlife as really something that was preserved for foreigners um, and not the general feels we are the burdens of conservation for you know we, we live beside animals that that can truly be uh, a nuisance or or dangerous uh, they can trample our crops they can even kill us but we're not realizing the benefits of conservation you know the benefits are, are accruing to the national park that's over there it's not part of our lives so the the change that community-based conservation has brought about and systems like the one in Arabia has brought about is that it's created local conservancies that do uh, they participate in the research in the sense in the uh, sorry in surveys of local wildlife they help to set hunting quotas they can um, benefit from they can partner with private companies or they can uh, start themselves that benefit from increased tourism due to the conservation work. And so they can realize some benefits from conservation. And, you know, it's not as if the benefit, the burdens of conservation go away. There are always some costs to managing species long term, but the benefits are enough um, to revive that sense of connection with local species. People, you know, I think people in general don't want their local species to go extinct. They just don't want to have to bear an unfair burden. Um, for their conservation. And so once that balance is, is made a little more just, uh, people do rise to the challenge. And, um, and these conservancies in Namibia have been very successful in preventing, for instance, uh, or controlling hunting of rhinos, which is, has been rampant throughout Southern Africa, and in restoring populations of elephants and um, lions, which were almost Due to drought and poaching and overexploitation, uh, were when these conservancies started very close to regional extinction. So I'll wrap up there. Um, I want to give the the last word to the brothers Huxley. Um, as I said, they were they were great friends. They Aldous Huxley did not share Julian Huxley's affection for a centralized authority, <laughs> uh, but they they certainly were were stimulated and inspired by each other, and they, they shared a, an interest in the relationship between humans and the rest of life. And they they often use the metaphor of amphibians to talk about the place of humans uh, in the web of life. And, and Aldous Huxley observed in an essay that he wrote, whether we like it or not, we are amphibians living simultaneously in the world of experience and the world of notions. Our business as human beings is to make the best of both of these worlds. And 
as a mission for the modern conservation movement, I think that works fairly well. I mean, we are we are dependent on the web of life. We can't get away from that vulnerability that we share with every other species on Earth. But we also are blessed and cursed with a certain amount of cleverness and inventiveness and and thanks to the modern conservation movement, knowledge about what other species need and how to provide, how to meet those needs. So because of that, I think we have a, a responsibility to protect those relationships, uh, relationships among species, among species, between species and habitats and between humans and other species, both for our sake and the sake of other species and the sake of the planet we share. So thanks very much. And I look forward to your questions. And, all right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with one question and then we'll get to the student uh, and faculty questions. Great. And this is related to what you just really mentioned, uh, ended with. Your, the epitaph to your book says, is reads as follows, says, maybe this is not a song about becoming extinct, though. Maybe this is a song about becoming. Why did you choose that? That's such an interesting, uh, interesting, and I think it is related to what you just said. Could you maybe elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, um, that's from a play uh, written by a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, I like that idea of I, I think I was I was pushing back against this dominant narrative of well the conservation movement is about extinction it's about preventing mm -hmm. extinction and and that's its central role and I have always felt no that's just table stakes that's just you know that's just our obligation and and what we're really going for is is something that's far beyond that and um, and I think in order to accomplish that we do have to become in a sense, um, in a somewhat, somewhat fanciful sense, we have to we have to step into our unusual role on this planet as 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 beings that are dependent on that breathe air, need fertile soil, <laughs> need clean water, but also have the capability to uh, influence the, the disproportionately influence the fate of the planet for better and worse. Okay, great. Now, this first question is from Adnan, a former student of mine. Asks, he says, I know it's improbable, but do you believe that dinosaurs will be able to come back? And maybe that's a larger question of can we reverse extinctions through, you know, uh, cloning or something like that? Do you see that as a possibility? Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of talk and, and probably uh, most of you have seen news stories about the possibility of what's called de-extinction which I is a term that I really don't like because it, it is not, I mean, it's fascinating to talk about, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't like the term because I feel like it over promises. Um, first of all, uh, we, the techniques are not yet perfected. And even, even when they are per perfected, they're not going to de-extinct anything. They're going to create a hybrid animal uh, from ancient DNA of an extinct animal. And, DNA from a similar animal that exists today. So when people talk about de-extincting woolly mammoths, for instance, they're talking about the possibility not yet realized of uh, creating an animal from elephant DNA and ancient DNA from woolly mammoth remains. Um, I, so, you know, possibly yeah. <laughs> it's it's possible yeah. and people who are involved in quote unquote de-extinction will will speak very passionately about their belief that you know these animals can play an ecological role but to me I, I feel like I, I feel somewhat irritated by the amount of coverage this has gotten in comparison to the progress in doing things that we already know work, for instance, protecting habitat for animals that still exist. <laughs> and I would rather see more attention right. to that. I'm not opposed. I don't, I don't have an ethical problem with this kind of work. And, and it may prove to be important um, in the in the bigger picture of conservation in the future. But I, I, I worry that it's being oversold. And I, and I do worry that the attention on it uh, might lead some people to think, oh, well, that's what conservation is now. Um, right. Species goes extinct. We can just bring it back eventually. Right. Okay. The next question is from David, and this is about the concept of balance mm. in nature and ecology. And 
Could you talk a little bit more about that? And um, he does mention at the end this concept is COVID, some type of example of a planet's biological system driving towards balance. Could you uh, elaborate on that? Um, yeah, I mean, balance is an, is an interesting, con it's a persistent concept in uh, the popular understanding of ecology, but ecologists themselves have really discarded it. Um, there's mm -hmm. an interesting book called called The Balance of Nature that, that is a, a historical look at the concept and uh, how it came to be such a metaphorical, such an important metaphor in ecology and then how ecologists have realized that that it's not so much balance, but disturbance that drives ecological systems. Mm. Um, that they, they really do not tend toward equilibrium. Um, so COVID, I mean, I think COVID is, is more of a sign of, of the disruption of relationships. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't yet know the origin of it. Um, and as, as David Quammen and other science journalists will point out, that, that's quite normal. <laughs> it's quite yeah. normal for us not to know the source of it. We don't, in fact, are not completely sure of the source of Ebola, which has been around for many years. But, you know, when and if we do pinpoint the, the source of COVID, I suspect that it's going to tell us that something about um, how humans have, have disrupted relationships between some Asian species and its habitat between people and that species. Okay, um, this is from Steve. Uh, there are parts of the world where numerous people are devoured by predators like tigers or crocodiles. Would the world be a better place if these predators became extinct? <laughs> well, it's a good question. I mean, mosquitoes, right? Mosquitoes are... <laughs> Uh, people say the mosquitoes, uh, so, you know, if we had the capability to get rid of them, should we? Um, I would, I would, uh, and, you know, I don't have a hard and fast answer to that question. I, I would, I would be much more loath to make something like a tiger or an alligator extinct uh, than a mosquito, uh, simply because I think it's pretty well, their role in the ecosystem is pretty well established. I think we could lose some species of mosquitoes without much of a disruption to the food web. But again, that we don't understand these systems to the full extent. So, you know, any kind of manipulation, you know, dramatic manipulation like that makes me nervous just because we don't know everything. Um, that said, I, I have I've been thinking about this a lot because of what I saw in Namibia where people were relearning how to live alongside quite dangerous animals and and they were, you know, they were, had been alienated or, or were, were outraged by the presence of these animals because they weren't realizing the benefits of conserving them. Uh, they were, you know, as I said, they were having to bear all the burdens, all the risks um, without being able to realize the benefits. And, and they, so now they have, not only do they realize those benefits, but they, because of these conservancies, they have more control. If there is a problem, you know, if there is a, an animal that gets habituated to humans and starts really making mischief, you know, can't be contained by uh, fences around crops and so forth, or starts, you know, stalking kids at an elementary school, God forbid, um, they can arrange for that animal to be shot. Uh, and so they do have a little more flexibility. Um, and I think, you know, it's important for us to understand that, that that's the people who live alongside these animals do confront real dangers. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. know, it's easy for people to say, oh, you know, let's, that whatever these, these animals are, you know, there's many, I, there were some uh, kind of shocking comments to me in a Washington Post story about elephant damage where people were saying things like, oh, well, there's, you know, a lot more humans than there are elephants. Um, and it's like, no, no, you know, you go live next to an elephant and you find out what it's like. So we have to acknowledge that it is a real danger, but also that there are ways to live alongside these species with pretty minimal risks. All right. This is from uh, a reader. The next question is from someone who's already read your book. Uh, you. Ask this. You make a passing reference in your book to echo fascists. Could you explain mm -hmm. a little more fully, fully who they are? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I I do look at the the recurring um, 
recurring incidents of racism and conservation. And that is, and I want to say emphatically that there's nothing racist about the practice of conservation. Um, desperately need more of it. Um, but for some reason, since the beginning of the modern conservation movement and every generation, there have been one or two prominent people who, who conflate their desire for, uh, they conflate their desire to protect certain species with a desire to protect what they see as their own race. Um, and you know, one of Hornaday's contemporaries, for instance, Madison Grant was a very successful conservationist, passed a lot of great state legislation in protecting animals, but also wrote this book called The Passing of the Great Race, which was um, one of, turned out to be one of Hitler's favorite books. Um, so this is not, you know, this is not a, a common thread or not a common frame of mind in conservation, but it's one that, that keeps recurring in generation to generation and you still see it sometimes i think it's expressed um and and people have called this a form of eco-fascism where, where people are uh they their belief in the in protecting other species curdles into this desire to control humans and kind of pick yeah. and choose better and worse humans. Um, so you see it sometimes expressed among radical environmentalists in terms of population control um, or a desire to uh, sort of, people have said kind of shocking things about quote unquote, letting nature take its course when there's a famine in a country with very few resources. And that's, it's a dark side of conservation that I think people should be aware of and that we should examine and and understand that that comes from that is built into the movement in some ways by its roots in cultures and and in wealthy countries and that I think um, it's worth understanding that history so that people can avoid that tendency today because I think those things get picked up by people who they don't should know better. Like right. Yeah. Well, one way they can understand this history is to read this book, Beloved Beasts. It's a wonderful book. I'd recommend it to everybody, of course. One final question, Michelle, and I suppose this relates to the future, and it's from a student. What do you mean by sustainability? I hear that term a lot, but I don't always know what it means. Mm, good question. And I think a lot of people use that term and, and uh, don't agree on what it means. <laughs> so right. I will give you my definition. Um, I think I might have used it when I was speaking about the uh, conservancies in Namibia. And in that context, I meant that they were, uh, they were using their local species. They eat a lot of local meat and uh, they, you know, it's a big, part of their diet. They also raise cattle in the desert, which is no easy task, let me tell you. Um, and But they hunt antelope and other fairly common species um, to supplement their diet. And the point of the conservancies is not to, um, is not to eliminate that use. It's to make sure that that use happens at a level at which it doesn't uh, diminish the population in the long term. So they're not, they're hunting, the amount of hunting that happens doesn't exceed the birth rate of the population. And so the, right. the population continues at more or less the same size over time. And then people of the following year or in the following generation can also enjoy uh, the, and in, enjoy harvesting uh, that population for their own nutritional benefit. I hope that makes sense. All right. So a, a care, a care for the future and the present. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. What a great way to start off our series for the uh, fall of 2021. Thank you so much. And I'd like to thank the audience for coming. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.